Several years ago, this graphic began circulating widely on Facebook. It sought to bring to light a forgotten atrocity carried out against the black population in the South right after the close of the Civil War. Over 100,000 newly emancipated black citizens were forced into a concentration camp called the Devil's Punch Bowl in Natchez, Mississippi, where through forced labor and starvation, 20,000 of them died. Then only a few months ago, Tim Murtaugh, the director of communications for Donald Trump's 2020 election campaign, brought to light another tragedy. Despite the news media awarding the election to Joe Biden, Murtaugh maintained that the election was fraudulent, and on those grounds, the media needed to cease its pronouncements. And just to add a little sauce, he tweeted this picture of the front page of the Washington Times as a reminder that the media emphatically do not choose the president. So the concentration camp in Natchez was a tragedy. Except it wasn't, because that never happened. Nor did the Washington Times ever print a front page declaring Al Gore the winner of the election in 2000. Both of these stories are patently false and in no way based in reality. And yet what they both have in common is that they were shared hundreds of thousands of times on Facebook and Twitter and other social media platforms. Now I don't think it's too much to say that we have an information problem in America. And more specifically, we have a misinformation problem, like huge swaths of the American American public are no longer certain what is true and what is false, and that confusion can have grave consequences. And if you're one of those Americans who struggle with this issue, then this video is for you. First, I'm going to define the problem of misinformation. Second, I'm going to explore the history of misinformation in America. And then third, I'm going to do my best to offer a cure. Now, in order to understand what misinformation is, we need to start by understanding the nature of information itself. Information is a derivative of the Latin verb informare, which literally means to form within. When a teacher instructs her students that two plus two equals four, she is trying to form in their minds the shape of truth. And truth is just the apprehension of the world as it really is. And as George Orwell reminds us in 1984, only a wicked tyrant will try to make us believe that two plus two equals five. So so if information molds a person's mind to the contours of reality, then misinformation molds a person's mind to the contours of a false reality. Now, misinformation by definition is usually spread with no malicious intent. I can still remember being a first year teacher and in my nervous energy one day, I had said that Alexander Hamilton was a US president. Now, I knew that Alexander Hamilton had never been president. I didn't mean to misinform my class, but it was misinformation nonetheless. But contrast that with disinformation information, which does carry malicious intent. It is purposely misleading and it is shared with the purpose of sowing discord and reaping chaos. And I take it as axiomatic and a point of mutual agreement that today we are buffeted by more information and misinformation and disinformation than ever before. Like since no sane person would willingly offer their minds to be formed into the shape of a false reality, how in the world are we supposed to discern true information from misinformation from disinformation? And that is an incredibly important question to ask in our age. But before we try to answer it, we need to understand that this is not a new problem. Now it would be impossible for me to run through every example of misinformation in the history of America, so I'll just give you a taste. In the highly contentious election of 1800, misinformation and disinformation campaigns filled the nation's newspapers. And in what is probably my favorite disinformation campaign in the election of 1800, Federalists began to spread rumors in the newspapers that Jefferson had died. I mean, today he would just get on TV and let everyone know that he was not in fact dead, but in those days, like, what could he do? So like, it's a complete lie, but you know, kind of makes me chuckle. Probably wasn't funny then, kind of funny now. Then move forward about a hundred years and we have the rise of what's known as yellow journalism. There was a fierce competition between two newspapers based in New York, one published by William Randolph Hearst and the other by Joseph Pulitzer. Both publishers discovered that sensationalism was the way to sell more newspapers and so each began to loosen their grip on the facts. And their commitment to sensationalism actually led the United States into a war. So at that time, Cuba was a Spanish colony, and owing to frequent Cuban revolts, the Spanish sent troops in to quell the uprising. Now, Pulitzer and Hearst picked up on this and published outlandish and exaggerated accounts of Spanish atrocities in Cuba, and the yellow journalists found that Americans had an insatiable appetite for such fare. Now, President McKinley was not interested in going to war with Spain. Like, he was a Civil War veteran. He had said he had seen his fill of blood. But as a compromise to the rising American sentiment against Spain, McKinley ordered an American battleship 
ship called the USS Maine to be stationed in Havana Harbor just to remind all the parties involved that America had interests in the conflict. Well, on February 15, 1898, the Maine exploded in the harbor, killing 260 of the crew on board. Now, McKinley's first instinct was to be reserved and not rush to a conclusion about the cause of the explosion, but Hearst and Pulitzer immediately began running headlines blaming Spain for the death of American sailors. And as it turns out, later investigations proved McKinley right and the yellow journalists wrong. The explosion was accidental and probably due to a fault in the coal chamber, but eventually McKinley was unwilling to withstand the pressure from the public who had been groomed by mass disinformation campaigns by Hearst and Pulitzer, and so he asked Congress for a declaration of war against Spain, and that is how you get the Spanish-American War. Now, to be clear, that's not the only reason we got involved in that war. I'm just focusing on the misinformation piece. Then there was the Vietnam War. President Nixon and then-President Ford told the American public that American troops were winning and that they were close to bringing the enemy's knees to the ground. Like, every time they went on television for years, they told the people, we're so close to victory, we just need a few more troops. And this is how they justified sending more and more Americans into the war. But the stories being told by journalists via newspapers and television constructed a different reality altogether. Vietnam was, in fact, a slaughterhouse, and Americans were no closer to victory than when they started. And according to the statistics kept by the Department of Defense, this disinformation campaign by the federal government cost the lives of something like 60,000 Americans. And bringing it into our present moment, only two weeks before this recording, the U.S. Capitol was infiltrated by a mob of insurrectionists because of a potent disinformation campaign waged by Donald Trump and other Republican sympathizers. He convinced his supporters that the election of 2020 in which Joe Biden won the presidency was illegitimate because of massive voter fraud. Now, I say this is a disinformation campaign because neither Trump nor anyone who worked for his campaign ever produced any substantive evidence that this was so. In fact, in over 60 court cases trying to overturn the election results, Trump's lawyers never even claimed that voter fraud had occurred, but rather voting irregularities. And that point is significant because lawyers know that unlike in the public, square, there are consequences for lying in court. And in all of the cases, judges ruled that there was not enough evidence to substantiate the claims. In other words, two plus two will never equal five. So the point is, misinformation and disinformation is not a novel problem with which our generation is forced to contend. But there is one very significant difference between misinformation campaigns in the past and those we deal with today, and that is the speed with which they spread. Like, to spread misinformation and disinformation widely in 1898, like, you had to own your own newspaper, and the barrier to entry was very high for that. But now we have platforms like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, which allow people like us to share all kinds of information, including misinformation, with ease and incredible speed. So the real question is, if we all want true beliefs and we rely on external information to acquaint us with truth, how do we not fall prey to misinformation and disinformation campaigns? Now, any effective cure presupposes a good understanding of the problem. So why is it that we allow ourselves to be duped by misinformation in the first place? You see, we like to think of ourselves as rational people who can discover truth by studiously sorting through the evidence and holding fast to the wheat of fact and discarding the chaff of fiction. We believe that we follow the rules of logic, accurately weigh competing probabilities, and finally arrive at our conclusions based on the best information available. But here's where I tell you, yeah, no. Not really. I mean, we're capable of that, that's just not how it works often in reality. In fact, I would wager that nearly everything you believe about everything that exists, you believe not because you sorted through the evidence yourself, but rather because someone else told you it was a true belief. For example, what do you know about planetary motion? Well, we know that the Earth revolves around the Sun and the Moon revolves around the Earth, and your conviction on that, like mine, is absolutely certain. But why? Have you ever seen it for yourself? Have you ever calculated the equations and spent years observing planetary motion through highly refined scientific tools? Of course not. We believe it because someone else told us it was the truth. In fact, if you lay out all your beliefs, you might be astonished how few of them are based on your own firsthand knowledge. I mean, I know that I'm bald, and that's a true belief because I have direct experience with it, but for almost all my other beliefs, I'm convicted of their truth because of what someone else told me. So the point is this, if most of what we judge to be true comes to us from other people, then it follows that we must rely on others to know what's true 
and what's not. And there's nothing we can do about that. Nobody has the time nor the skills to investigate every belief we hold by means of original research. So with that in mind, maybe it's clear why we end up falling for misinformation and disinformation throughout the ages. We are relying on other actors to tell us what is true, and those actors aren't always going to do so. And that might be because they're ignorant, or it might be because they mean to deceive us. Okay, so that's an external reason why we believe misinformation. Now, let me offer three internal reasons. The first is confirmation bias, and this is the idea that we seek out information that conforms to our pre-existing beliefs, whether it is true or not. President McKinley was not convinced that the Spanish blew up the Maine, but there was a whole host of people who had been primed to believe it after months of Pulitzer and Hearst's sensational accounts of Spanish atrocities. To them, it was just one more piece of evidence that conformed to their pre-existing beliefs about Spain. And why would any of us who prize our rational nature do this? In my opinion, it comes down to Leon Festinger's theory of cognitive dissonance. He argued that when we are presented with information that contradicts our beliefs, it creates a kind of psychological crisis, and with it, discomfort. So we naturally seek out information that will help us avoid such discomfort. And as you're probably aware, our social media platforms are built upon the foundation of confirmation bias because their algorithms try to understand what kind of information we want and then serve it up in increasing measure and never show us information that might instigate discomfort because the last thing they want is for us to be driven away from their platforms. Now, the second reason we believe misinformation is because of repeated exposure, and it was the magnificent Heather Cox Richardson who brought this to my attention. Suppose one of your coworkers told you that the reason your company is failing is because the boss is embezzling money. Now, suppose you like your boss. You have never had any reason to question the character of your boss, and so it's likely that you'll dismiss this thought as a base rumor which does not conform to the truth. But then, three other coworkers on separate occasions tell you the same thing. All the sudden, even if you believe your boss to be above reproach, maybe you start to wonder, could it be true? The more we are presented with an idea, the more plausible it seems. If Donald Trump had claimed election fraud once, it may be that January 6th would not have happened. But after claiming it hundreds of times, many of his followers began to believe that maybe there was something to that claim. The third reason we believe misinformation is because of our need for social belonging. And for those who study this phenomenon, this is the most important reason and has the most explanatory power for the problem of the spread of misinformation. We tend to believe any kind of information because that's what our social social group believes, and to reject such conclusions is to place yourself in danger of exile from the group to which you belong. And the crazy thing is, is that misinformation binds people together just as much as true information. Think again about the group who stormed the Capitol. Like, what if one of them had stood up in the middle of the scuffle and said, you know what, I think the election was legitimate. He might end up dead, but he would surely be cast out of that community. So there is powerful social pressure to believe certain information about the world, whether it is true or whether it is false. Now, at this point, if you're anything like me, there's a little despair in your heart. I mean, if all of this is true, what possible defense can we mount against believing what is not true? And actually, the answer isn't to go investigate everything for yourself. Like, if I wanted to really know firsthand whether the election was fraudulent, I'd have to somehow get access to Dominion voting machines, learn a whole set of technical skills in order to assess whether they were functioning properly, and then I would have to read thousands upon thousands of pages of court transcripts and investigate all the evidence for myself, and none of us is going to do that. Not because we don't care about the truth, but because we don't have the time, we don't have the money, we don't have the mental capacity to pursue that answer. So let me offer three solutions to this problem that are within our reach and maybe a little bit closer to reality. Supposing misinformation and disinformation are never regulated by the federal government and they keep flooding us at the current pace, then it's not up to anyone but us to learn how to defend ourselves from it. So my first solution is to adopt a posture of skepticism. Not cynicism, but skepticism. If you know that there is a very good chance that misinformation will be coming your way, then the first line of defense is to withhold immediate belief, and certainly immediate sharing on social platforms. And this posture of skepticism can be reduced to a single phrase. At least that's how it works for me. And that phrase is this. I bet it's more complicated than that. Because the truth is, everything is more complicated than it is usually presented to us. And this is especially true when the information provokes an intense emotional reaction, which is usually the first sign that you're seeing disinformation. So I just find that phrase to be a useful tool whenever anyone shares information with me that stirs my emotions. Like, 
It must be more complicated than that. The second solution is to read good books. And look, I know nobody's got time for that, but hear me out. I was once told that one of the ways bankers know a counterfeit bill is because they handle such an abundance of genuine bills. And because they are so acquainted with what a true bill feels like in their hands, they are immediately able to feel the difference in a counterfeit. And the same is true with ideas and argumentation. Like a nonfiction book is just a long argument, and if the author is worth his or her salt, they will be presenting evidence and coming to conclusions. And in order for you to benefit from those conclusions, you have to spend a long time in the presence of that author. And the more time you spend in the presence of good arguments, the more easily you'll be able to spot false ones. The third solution is to seek out trustworthy gurus. Since all of us come to conclusions about the world based on what other people tell us, then it will be important to find people who are smarter than you and smarter than me and let them tell you about what you can never learn for yourself. And how do you find somebody that you can trust to tell you the truth? Well, first, they need to be an expert in their field, or at least be able to interpret the experts in a field. Second, they need to be humble enough to acknowledge their own biases, even if they're firm in their convictions. Third, and maybe most important, they present their knowledge of the world with complexity. And that is so important, because the sure sign of someone trying to lead you into false beliefs is that they reduce the complexity of the world into two categories, either good and evil, or black and white, or on and off. And you only have to have been alive for five minutes to know that that's not how the real world works. So run away from those people as fast as you can. Misinformation and disinformation are not going away, and we cannot hide ourselves from it. But if you, like me, refuse to believe that 2 plus 2 equals 5, then that means that we'll be together on the front lines of the attack. Thank you so much for watching. And because the problem of misinformation and disinformation is such a big problem today, I'm in the process of making a second part to this video, which will focus on Russian disinformation campaigns and the skills that we need to guard ourselves against them. So thanks to Eileen Brannick and Alistair Paul who helped researching this video and editing was done by me with help from Taylor Stone. Thanks again, as always, to the Paul Family Foundation who has provided generous support in getting this video made. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.